with the talk about AI chat GPT, do you feel it will add or enhance cloud penetration testing? I'll say it will enhance. A lot of people actually spend their time debugging their automation scripts. So I think that part chat GPT can take away very easily. And again, there is another aspect to it. If you know that there is some library that exists in Python for certain things, yeah. then you know it. If you don't know it, there's a, I'll say, skip uh, learn curve. You have to know about it. You have to search, okay, four to five or that GPT. If you just ask it, okay, what is the library? Can you give me a simple code? Just like that, you, have, you can run it and uh, you can see if it works. Happy Chinese New Year to everyone celebrating. This is the year of the rabbit, which is supposed to be the luckiest animal. So I hope it brings everyone luck as well. Not just because you may have even born in the year of the rabbit, but even if you're not born in a year of the rabbit, I hope this brings a lot of joy and a lot of luck in your life as well. Let's get into the episode. Have you tried teaching someone cloud security? Leave it all AWS cloud security. In this month, we are talking about how you can train others to be at least thinking like hackers. You don't have to be a hacker. Having that mindset always helps. And as someone who's always believed in learning the offensive side, be better at the defense side. And this sounds like the announcement of a course coming in. No, the course is not coming now, but this is something that we share in this episode of Cloud Security Podcast. For this, we had Nishan Sharma, who is the director of lab platform and education platform called INE. And they have released an open source tool called AWS Code which it comes with MIT license. You can use it yourself and you can use that to train yourself in cloud security. And these are common scenarios of what are some of the common use cases you see. This obviously is a great conversation for people who are trying to learn. This is also valuable for people who are trying to do defense in AWS as well. A lot of us, whether you're a cloud security architect, you're a cloud security engineer, or you are just a security engineer, what you would realize is that a lot of defenses that you're trying to build, whether it's using AWS SCP, guard duty, threat detection, throw every security word out there. All of that comes down to thinking like how a bad hacker would. And what we spoke about during this conversation is just about AWS code, how you can use that to train yourself. Yes, we spoke about ChatGPT as well. We also spoke about what are some of the common tools? How do you even start with scenarios which involve things like serverless Lambda? How do you protect against them so that you don't at least don't allow the bad hacker to break out of the container? That and a lot more is in this episode. And if you are someone who's interested in starting to defend AWS cloud and want to start at least knowing the foundational pieces, then this is the episode for you. And again, this is not the announcement of the upcoming AWS security course that I have. We are definitely running a capture the flag before that. So I keep an eye out for that. And as always, if you find value from this episode, I would definitely appreciate you sharing with some of your friends who may be on the same journey. If you're listening to our Cloud Security Podcast for the second or third time, if you can leave us a review or rating on your popular video platform like YouTube or LinkedIn, or your audio platform, if you leave us a review or rating there, it definitely helps us find more interesting people. So when they see the podcast episode or when they hear on any podcast platform, they get to see how much value they can provide to the existing audience as well. And I want to say thank you to everyone who's been sharing their feedback on LinkedIn or messaging me saying how much they enjoyed the episodes. Thank you so much. I really appreciate this. It means a lot. And I just wanted to say thank you. I hope you enjoyed this episode. I will see you in the episode later this weekend where we talk about actual pen testing. So today we spoke about the training involved in becoming a pen tester in the cloud. Next week, we're going to talk about how do you even do pen testing in cloud. And I'll keep it a secret for now. And until then, I hope you enjoyed this episode. I will see you soon. By bringing developers and security together, you don't have to choose between speed and security. Develop fast, stay secure. Could you tell the audience a bit about yourself? Sure, Ashish. First, thank you for uh, calling me on to the show. I have been, uh, you know, a watcher, a subscriber, <laughs> whatever you like to call it, for some time. And yeah, it is really insightful, and it is a good opportunity for us as well to, you know, to showcase something like that. So my team is the one who actually builds new capabilities for running different, different kind of labs. We make this, you know, system more scalable, available in different, different regions. We keep it secure and all of that. So that's what I'm currently doing with them. So because you're talking about AWS Cloud and AWS Goat as well, how would you describe penetration testing in AWS? Like, what does that mean for you when people say I'm pen testing in cloud or pen testing in AWS? Okay. 
So I think the word mainstreaming has been around for quite some time now. Before this, before the cloud, uh, you know, when mainstream people were talking about uh, application mainstreaming, people were talking about network mainstreaming, and uh, so similarly, you know, when people say cloud application mainstreaming or cloud account mainstreaming, right? What they are trying to do here is they are trying to assess the security or security posture of the AWS account or whatever you have deployed on AWS, you know, in, in the cloud. So a cloud penetrator, depending on you know if he's internal, external, you know how uh, much information or how much rights are provided to him, is trying to assess that. And the main thing that you worry about are misconfigurations because vulnerabilities, as soon as they know it, they patch it. In cloud, if AWS finds something, it is already patched for everyone, right? So I think the main focus for people there is to find the entry point. So you know because. Nobody is actually going to give you access to their AWS account, so you have to find a way to get in. And I think the most common way of doing that is to target the web applications or the APIs. And once you have that, after that begins this domino trail. You know, one domino will fall, and then the second domino will fall. And this thing is uh, way bigger when it comes to AWS because the infra is so big, right? The scope is so big. It is multi-region, multi-service. So all of that is there. To level the playing field, as you were saying, earlier, how would you describe web app penchesting and network penchesting, and how different is that to cloud penchesting? So web penchesting and network penchesting, as I was mentioning, right, they're around for quite some time now. When you say web application penchesting, it was very important whenever you were talking about penchesting. So when you are talking about web application penetration, for example, suppose I, you know, put up a very simple PHP website on a web server which I am hosting. So now, I means you can divide it into infrastructure security and web application security. But generally, when people say this, they target both points. So they will see if they can find some vulnerability in a wasp top ten or something else. And similarly, they also will try to see if they can reach out to the server and see if there are something other things open, right? So, for example, most of the cases when people run WordPress. They're actually using one server, and uh, this MySQL database is also running on the same. So in that case, the scope is covering both. Points. Yeah. When we talk about network contesting, it is more about you know what all you can find when you are connected to a network, right? and obviously finding is the first step. Then you try to find you know which hosts are there, trying to find what all they are exposing, what kind of services are there, which services are not protected, and then you try to attack that. And then there are other attacks, and the responsibility for the infra used to fall on the people who are deploying the application and you know, maintaining it. Now with the cloud, I think uh, the main shift that is there is uh, a shared responsibility model. You don't have to worry about the infra. You know, AWS or whoever is the provider is actually taking care of it. So you don't see a real physical switch that you have to manage. You want to put up a VM and you want to make it secure. There is a security group that you have to configure, and it is very easy to do. But here, new things that are coming in are the misconfiguration. So you have to make sure that the, the IAM rules that you are making, the other rules, the policies, all of that are good. They are not giving excessive privileges. They, they are using the, the good practices and all of that. Again, means uh, in cloud, there is another aspect that is there. When you had a fixed infra, you know that people cannot abuse more than that. In cloud, you don't have that. Interesting. And I think you dropped in the OWASP top ten as well. And I think a lot of the AWS cloud elements, GOAT elements, link over there as well. So maybe if you could probably introduce what AWS GOAT is and what was the reason for starting it and we can probably talk about OWASP top ten after that as well. So, what is AWS Code? So, AWS Code is actually you know a little effort from our side to give back to community. So, you know, as I was discussing before with you in our last call, that so we were hiring a lot of engineers who are going to you know work on AWS and GCP and Azure, and we wanted to teach them as well as on keeping the system secure. So, you know. We asked them to watch some conference videos, go through the blogs. We did the same, and then after that, we came up with a list. That okay, let's build all of these things which are affected by these vulnerabilities, and then we will test them. Yeah. So when we did this, and it took you know a couple of weeks. After that, when we put it together, it, it looked like something which you know a new user can use to learn AWS security hands-on, because uh, especially for the novices, we actually begin with it. There are multiple factors that are there. You have to, you know, ensure that uh, you're deploying the infrastructure. 
we're taking it down correctly otherwise it can be charged and all of that and then the most important thing i think is the exploitation part if you have never done it before you know you are going to not feel the confidence that you are okay i can do it yeah so that package it into you know easily deployable which you can extend and configure to easily and put it on github and then you know we we told our company and then they were very supportive they're like okay yeah it looks good for the community so you know why don't you guys actively uh, do so that is what aws code was as a product and right now it is on github you can just go there you can scope the repository and use it for actions you just have to set to three parameters and it will automatically deploy on your account and it is as easy to take it down after you have done this obviously it's a vulnerable project so nobody is advised to use it in production environment Yeah. It, it is supposed to be a new account that is there for just for trial. Yeah, so people can use that for training themselves in pen testing. I think it is way bigger than that. Again, uh, when you have a tool, right? There is like hundred ways of using the tool depending on what the tool is. So in case of AWS Code, you have uh, the application code, you have the infrastructure as code in Terraform. Okay. And then once you deploy it, the first thing that you have already covered is you have seen the code uh, for both things. So you can learn IAC using it. You can tweak it. You can deploy it. See what happens, right? Then once it is deployed, you will have a web application. We have multiple modules. The first module is a blog application, and the second module is the HR application. And the reason for doing this in modular approach is because each application has different components depending on you know what it is doing. And those components, if you want to create a scenario, it will not look realistic. For example, if there is a blog application. why you know blog application will use something like you or something mm. doesn't make sense right so that's why we have made sure that we have kept the back end infra which is required to deploy that application very realistic as realistic as we can get in this case so once you deploy it you can try to break into it using different vulnerabilities that are there so we have put in was top 10 web application vulnerabilities on the web application side that people can see similarly once you have deployed it you have exploited it and again in the for exploitation we actually give you manuals we actually give you videos so you know you can see and you know think through exactly that uh, yeah. you're not able to do it on your own and once you have done that after that comes the defense center because you have full visibility and it is your account so you have full control so now you can try to see which aws native things like gardp like the messy and other things what all you can use to detect these and to contain these because you know again means there is a saying that either that hat so it is better to get prepared for the second one so if you can detect it or contain it i think that should be the objective so you can do that then you can do the security engineering by modifying the iac you can deploy and make sure that you know this vulnerability doesn't work now so yeah all the things you can do with it depending on what your objective is it's pretty awesome i, I think as you were saying i think there's a question that came in from rodrick and i think it's pretty timely as well do you need permission from aws to do penetration testing against your aws account resources so for your own account that you own you don't really need that because you are checking your system right and when we say you know by testing we are not doing something different entirely right we are doing the same operations that a normal user will do But we are just doing it in the way to find things. So, for example, uh, most of the cases when you are doing enumeration on uh, AWS account, so you get access to it, and now you are doing enumeration. You are actually having the same commands in the backend. They do that they use like Paku or something, right? So they use the same kind of API requests in the backend. So, for AWS, apart from the volume, uh, they don't, they cannot actually differentiate in it apart from the volume part. So up to a level, they don't really care because it is your account, and you know if you are trying to make it secure, then it is all fine from their side. That's awesome, and I think I'm gonna add a few bit. Hopefully, that answers your question, Rory. But feel free to ask your follow-up question. I'm gonna attach on to another question where so. What would be the difference between say pen testing the application versus say pen testing AWS S3 bucket? Because I would have thought the pen testing for both of them, to your point about shared responsibility. If you run pen test AWS S3, you're technically in AWS territory point in time, right? Or is that okay to kind of do some, I don't know, end map at it and see what comes out? Means you can try that, but I think that part they are already handling, so you are not going to see much there. So 
and you have brought it when you have mentioned it. So whenever you are spinning a uh, your EC2 instance in AWS, and if you are getting a public IP on it, AWS actually have these registered block of IPs which are actually public. So you can actually you don't know which one, but you know it is from that one. So there are mass scanners. They are scanning for it as soon as they find SSL or something. Automatically, they try all the root passwords. And if once you know you get SSH login success, they will actually install a crypto miner or a you know DDoS bot client or something on it. So means they are not stopping them. So <laughs> I don't see them stopping anyone else. Uh, actually, it's a good point because if you the whole crypto miner thing is interesting because you would get notification that hey, crypto miner potentially on your EC2 instance, but they could technically, to your point, block it. They don't have to like make it a notification and you take an action accordingly, I guess, which simply had blocked it if they want to do. So that's pretty interesting, man. Then how different is say, I, I guess to your point then AWS Goat is deploying application into AWS. And when we try and say work through scenarios in each of the modules of AWS Goat, we're technically just testing the application and I guess the thing underneath, is that right? So that's the thing, right? So when you're talking about that you're managing or, you know, a third party department where you have deployed something, it actually stops there. The scope actually stops there. So for example, suppose you're targeting WordPress or something. So from WordPress, you are, means even if you hack everything in it, you are going to get access to their modifications and the database. That's what you care about. Yeah, However, yeah. when you have deployed a complicated application on AWS, so if I take example of module one for AWS code, so we have deployed this application, this core application using uh, serverless, that is Amazon Lambda. Yeah. So in Lambda, whenever you put code, and if you want to define some things exchange, right? So for example, I want to put uh, how to access uh, the S3 bucket, that is, which is secure. In that case, you define things in environment variables, things in configuration files and all of that. Now, AWS is taking care of its security. However, if the application that you have deployed, if it has problems, like the module one of AWS, it has particular problems. So once you get your foothold into the Lambda, now you have crossed the boundary from the application to the AWS infra side. So once you're in the serverless, you can try to stop these environment variables. You can try to see what are the connection strings there. You can try to see what are the keys there. And from there, you can also check if there is some role attached to it. From there, you can try to get the temporary access credentials. You can try to see what all is allowed on it. And then from there, you can jump, right? And after that, it is all you know, trying and failing and you know jumping to the another service, another service, and another service. Yeah. So that's the boundary, right? You just cross from the one side to the other side, and now it is limitless. And once you, yeah. if you have hidden load or something, yes, you can do anything and everything. You can destroy their infra, you can spin up multiple machines. And the thing with admin rule is if it is not properly configured and they are not using the organization code and SCPs and other things to control it. You pretty much disable their detection mechanisms as well, right? The guard duty and other things also you can do if it is just an account, not an organization. Actually, there's another question from Roderick here. What are cloud penetration testing tools used for pen testing? There are multiple ones. It totally depends what exactly you want to do. But generally, when people ask this question and they're starting up, they're, they're talking about the enumeration and the basic prediction. I think Paku is one of the tools, PSU. Uh, it is one of the tools that is uh, very famous. We have used it. It works fantastic. And if you want to do animation and everything, it will bring down the effort on your side uh, you know, by a very great deal. That is the first one. And then, you know, as you know, right, open source community is uh, is a very engaged community. So when you put something out, uh, people will try to, you know, create folks of it, try to bring more tools in. So multiple other tools are there. And you can start from there. Awesome. Thank you for asking that. And again, feel free to ask for a follow-up question, Roderick, if you like. So you mentioned uh, the, I guess, the crossing the boundary into the AWS Lambda land. And we spoke about the fact that uh, I think what you said is absolutely right as well, because you're technically doing exactly the things that you would expect to do in an AWS Lambda EC2 or whichever service you talk about. But I think what you're looking for is at that point in time misconfiguration, because yeah. I guess the first two episodes of this month of break the AWS was around cloud security research, they said the same thing as well. They're not really trying to do, I don't know, like hardcore deep zero day somewhere basically, but they're trying to come from a perspective of this is how a normal person, or at least this is how AWS expects you to use it, 
but what's the way if I change, I don't know, parameter one to two, does it make a difference? Or if I try different kind of fuzzing, does it make a difference? So I think it's very well said. I think one of the things that you called out over here, the wireless misconfiguration as well, I think oh, the, actually the Tom's question is kind of like where I was going with, so I'm going to bring up Tom's. How useful is the metadata RL of a cloud instance? Very. Actually, the metadata service that you can access in GC2, right? So AWS actually had to make changes to it just to prevent it from the SSRF attacks. So what people were doing, they were deploying web application on EC2. And if your application is vulnerable to SSRF, where you can you know, make the server, make the request on your behalf, you can actually make a request through the web application to the metadata service, and then you can get some information. From that information, you will be able to actually obtain a temporary access credential, a token. And from there, you will be able to access everything that the role or the EC2 machine actually had access to. So for that, plus actually had made some change. I, I'm not recalling it just to make it more difficult, but it is still possible if you have a foothold on machine now. The the change you're referring to is version one, version two of the- Yes, exactly. Well. So yeah. I think it's probably- I actually covered it in my class, but I don't remember right now what exactly yeah, was yeah, the change. Man. But I, I think to Tom's question, I guess it's still useful because many people have not upgraded themselves to V2. They still use V1 of INGS. So I think, I think to what Tan called out, this is definitely something you would still find quite everywhere as well. Oh yeah, so someone else called out that played a quite a big role in the Capital One data breach as well, which is also true. Uh, I think the Amazon the hacker used it as well. Sorry, uh, did you have some thoughts on that as well? Capital One and anyone else that you know of that basically exploited this? So I, I'm not sure about the Capital One. I have not checked it in detail. But when we were taking these vulnerabilities for AWS code, at that time we made sure that we are always seeking those things which have actually happened in, in uh, you know, real world. So this thing happens so much that you know, means, you know there are countless examples. If you just search for it, SSRF risk uh, hack, you will get multiple examples of this. And the same thing can also happen in the containerized environment, by the way. Yeah, yeah. Hundred percent. Like it's like a who is this service as well? Probably the best way to explain it. So who is this service? So what is this service? And I think the person who called out that was Tanner. Yeah. But I think at least having read the report for the Capital One, that was basically exploiting metadata URL. So I mean, not really exploiting URL, but using the URL for your advantage to find out about it. So thanks for yeah. pointing that out as well. Feel free to question follow up questions as well, folks, as we kind of go deeper into this as well. So you mentioned the scenario where you were talking about AWS Lambda, the serverless misconfiguration. And a lot of times when people go for pen chest, they kind of talk about the whole OWASP top 10, which you kind of mentioned earlier as well. Like, I think, is there a lot of overlap between the two or is there just no overlap and or OWASP top 10 is like just, just a web app thing. And then there is like the whole two year point. That's like a whole different universe on it. Is there an overlap or are they mutually inclusive? So OWASP actually have lists for everything. They have lists for cloud, they have lists for uh, web and everything. So in cloud, they actually mention all of these. They're not mentioning serverless exactly, but you know, they, they talk about, okay, they can be problem with the access control. They can be problem with, you know, whatever roles you have provided and all of that. So yes, there's, there's a huge, uh, you know, overlap in terms of concept, I can say. And in AWS code, uh, all the web applications we have used uh, OWASP top 10 web for uh, 2021, because you know, we developed it in 2022, so at that time, 2021 was the latest. Uh, and similar for cloud side as well, we have actually referred, referred that. And uh, the way OWASP does this ranking, right, makes it very, very useful to actually use for us, because this is something that they are seeing in the uh, outside world, right? So most people, uh, again, means as a security researcher, I'm very fascinated about the vulnerabilities and the zero days and other things. But I think the most of the time, if you see, just like you uh, mentioned, right, the capital one level page. And even if you check the APTs, right, the advanced persistent threat groups, you know, it's uh, on my page, uh, website, if you go, they have this full blown section. Where people are actually not aware of it, but there's so much knowledge there. So if you go there, click on APTs, you'll actually see a list of all the own APTs. And if you click on those, you'll actually see what kind of techniques they have been using. And some things are so, so simple that you will not even believe that this is leading to the APT threats and all of that. Similarly, most of the time when we are looking for, uh, you know, looking into these hacks and the problems, it actually comes from naive mistakes, platform decisions and all of that. Yeah. If you cover those, I think 80-90% is always covered. 
Yeah, I think what that reminds me. So on the Attack Mitre website, one of the things they call out for the kill chain or I guess the attack path for a hacker for cloud was phishing. Mm-hmm. And it was almost you almost like what phishing leads to, but I think exactly who who was it? I think oh yeah. So the Uber breach that happened, you know, recently where the two made the spoke about oh our so and so many records were kind of lost. And they also called out over there that, oh, our AWS credential and Azure credential were lost as well. I think people focus on the data rather than the fact that, oh, wait, their actual production data could also be compromised because they have lost access to their AWS accounts. But I mean, it it kind of tells you two things. One, it also makes you aware that a lot of people don't see cloud as a, you know, as a production environment. Because when you started talking about AWS code, you said, don't use this in your production environment. But how many people even consider that, oh, cloud could have dev tests, like people actually run stuff in production over there. So it's sensitive from that perspective and bringing it back to all top 10 as well. If it was being given a lot of consideration for kind of working towards, I guess this internally as well, because I think one of the, uh, I guess, takeaway that I would love to have for people in this conversation that you and I are having is a, obviously is to teach themselves if they want that they can choose is to use the open source AWS kind of worked on and you guys have created. The other thing is also teaching other people as well. I mean, especially imagine, I think when I had a team, one of the biggest challenge to what you faced when you were trying to do AWS Gord, how do you teach someone AWS Gord or kind of scenario? How do you teach someone pen testing cloud when the only thing you can find on the internet is, hey, get an AWS certification, but that doesn't teach you the, the security side. How do you normally recommend people who try and want to build an internal training for cloud security and not necessarily for pen testing, but maybe just for cloud security. What do you normally recommend to them? Yeah. So, you know, I'm in this training space for actually eight years now, yeah. conducting trainings, workshops, you know, building courses, labs, everything. I think the best way, and you know, I think I have also seen this progression in, in especially in the infosec training industry over the past few years is that hands-on training, right? And there is nothing better than that. If you can do it hands-on, the kind of results in terms of skills, in terms of confidence, in terms of your readiness, it is unparalleled. So, yes, I'm not saying that theory is not important. Yes, you should do theory, but I think now it is like 20% of the theory and 80% of the hands-on is what is, uh, you know, making you win. So whenever someone is starting, I'll say, don't really jump into theory too much. Just get the basics. So for example, if you're for beginning with WS pen testing, right? There is no direct way which is recommended to directly jump into this. First, you need to know the basics. So AWS basics is the one one thing that you have to make. You have to make sure that you know what is IAM, what is available, what are SCE. All of that is the first step. Once you have spent some time here, go create your own account and then create some resources, try to put the policy, just don't spin the EC2 instances. Most people do that, most people just create S3 buckets and after that they're like, okay, done. But try to set some policies here. And after that, take a tool like AWS code, set it up. And when you go from you know, end to end in this process, the kind of confidence it will give you, it is just the first step that you're taking and it is the hardest one, I think. Once you have done that, it will give you immense, uh, XP, uh, you know, I'll say confidence to actually go ahead and carry out so many tools that are out there using, you know, either the AWS Cloud Shell or maybe your own machine. Try to do them hands-on and then repeat this thing. And obviously you don't need to cover all the 100 or 200 services of AWS. Most uh, of, of the organizations, they actually use uh, top 10 or 20. So this is all doable step by step. But theory, I think the first basics of AWS is something that, uh, you know, that is very important and which people actually overlook that. And then when they directly jump into tools and everything, they just, they'll just follow the video and after that, okay, so what now? <laughs> so, so you won't be having this problem if, you know, if you take some time and I, I know it is not the, the best thing, but again, it's important. All right. So, so just to summarize, basically get the AWS fundamentals first, once you've done that, build an account, EC2 instance, whatever, but put some SCP policies and then deploy something like AWS Goat or similar yeah. and use that as a way to at least, cause I think there's a module so you can actually go walk through different modules of AWS Goat. So towards the end, cause I was going to come to that as well. A lot of people are like, okay, I guess I've done the modules now what? So you can do basically saying you can add more based on the company you work in, or maybe scenario you may have seen. Is, is that right? Like, so you can keep growing and not just like, 
or all models are done and that's the end of it yeah, yeah obviously not it is not and the good thing is because it is open source and everything is there right try to make things to it once you do some tweaking in the ipc now i think the opportunities and the things that you can do it is limitless because you can just uh, the iac documentation for terraform it is like like one of the best documentation that i have seen so you can just go there try to find you know, what kind of resource you want to deploy and it will actually show you this is the thing that you have to copy paste and these are the things that you have to change so by using that you can actually create your own scenarios for your own uh, company right your own uh, whatever you are managing you can try to replicate all of that using isc or maybe even manually and that is where you can find test it and you know once you have some you know insights into the security postures you know how to improve it then maybe deploy the changes onto the production i was going to say the one thing that i love in the entire conversation is that you did, for you did not mention what was it gali oh yeah sorry so they've changed their name now yeah so because i remember when i did the offensive security training for oscp it was kind of like drilled in like everyone who would bring their laptop to a ctf they would have Kali installed on it. That was like step one. I'm totally a hacker right now. I'm glad you didn't mention it because a lot of people just assume that I need to have track or Kali installed. But I'm glad you mentioned the fact that build something and then try. Because you don't have to be like super sophisticated to like you know go down this path. Is that right? Yep. And I also use Kali. I love it. I have been using it for so many years now. Nothing against them. But the way we do things, we ask them to bring Kali as well if you need to use it. Otherwise, the other way that we try to use for AWS. is create your own account in the account you actually get this thing called cloud shell right you can get a shell inside the cloud and it is free yeah yeah and it is so easy to actually install things in it so if you want to install parku or some other pen testing tool it is very easy to install it there and you can take it away with you right even if you go somewhere you open your own account and from there you know, it will work so we yeah. install most of the tools in that and from there you know then you can do things But yeah, nothing is done no. because installing Parku on your own EC2 instance. It's cloud shell because if you do EC2, then you know you are paying for the EC2. Cloud shell is free. Ah, uh, right. Okay. So you, oh, actually, yeah, because cloud shell is just an instance over there, right? Doing it in in one of the EC2s in the backend, but they don't charge you for it. Yeah, yeah. So it's a point in time thing. Yeah, uh, but it is persistent. So means, you know, whenever you need it, you just click on that console button on the top of AWS's screen. And it will just give you a CLI, and in that you can do everything that you want to. I have never tried that. That's why that's well. Yeah, you should. So, so if I log into AWS account and I go to AWS Cloud Shell and I install Paku, and for whatever reason life got in the way, I switch off the browser, come back in, switch off the browser again, open Cloud Shell again, it should remember that Paku is installed on my account. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It should. Until unless you you know delete it or on your phone, then it will go away. Otherwise, it is there. The same thing is there in Azure as well as in GCP as well. They have also their own shells. You can do things in it, and it will be there. Interesting. That that's very fascinating for me, man. And it is very very helpful when you are dealing with AWS's own uh, you know account. So you know if you want to do something in the same account, using the cloud can actually save you so many hassles. You don't have to install the AWS login or something. You know their utilities on your machine. And it will. It is not going to conflict with something. You are not keeping those credentials there on your local machine, right? Because sometimes, if it is not your personal account, you don't want to do that, right? If it is not your own personal machine, you don't want to keep those credentials there. So, interesting. Wait, so training primarily can be done by cloud shell, like instructions for people who are thinking about internal training. Instead of trying to talk about EC2 and all of that, because primarily people are CLI users, you could just go straight to, hey, don't worry about EC2 instance with that. Use AP, these API commands and Cloud Shell. Use these API commands. Most of the tools that we have seen, uh, which we use for it, most of them actually work. Apart from one or two tools which are a little fuzzy, uh, for that you can use EC2. Otherwise, most of the tools now, and it is getting better and better. If you remember, right, five yeah. or seven years yeah. in time, it was a nightmare to install some of the tools. Yes. Now all of that is not there. Yeah. Most of the things are Python based. You just copy it and it works. Yeah, actually that's a good point, man. I'm gonna give that a yes. shot. I, I've got a question here from Roderick. With the talk about AI Chat GPT, do you feel it will add or enhance cloud penetration testing? I'll say it will enhance because Chat GPT is giving you answers very quickly. Because most of the time, even for the snippets, right, the basic Python snippets, I'll say. 90% time it has given me good outputs. I'm using it. Uh, I'm regularly using it. It saves me a lot of time when you want to do small automations in Bash or Python or something. 
In terms of even the cloud pen testing, right? The subject matter is also there. I think if we take that effect into consideration, ChatGPT and advancement in AI from a pen tester's point of view, yes, is going to help us a lot. Oh, because then you can automate a lot of your testing as well. So if you don't know, how yeah, to a lot of people actually spend their time debugging their automation scripts. So I think that part ChatGPT can take away very easily. And again, there is another aspect to it. If you know that there is some library that exists in Python to certain things. Yeah. Then you know it. If you don't know it, there's a, I'll say, steep uh, learning curve. You have to know about it. You have to search, okay, four to five are that GPT. If you just ask it, okay, what is the library? Can you give me a sample code? Just like that, you, have, you can run it and uh, you can see if it works. So it is taking that up or down. Yeah, wow. Because yeah. I think I've been using the chat GPT thing for building AWS resources and it does a really good job in doing an IAC of that as well. Yeah. I, mean, I, have, I haven't done the flip yet, so I'm going to try some flip. But thanks for that question, Roderick. I appreciate that as well. Feel free to follow, ask a follow-up as well. But if you ask it to like complicated programs, uh, like a multiple kill chain kind of, or? Means even if you talk about the, the programs, right? I have seen if you ask it to do something for programmers, but uh, a little complicated to implement. So for example, suppose I want to create permutation and combinations from a word to generate a word list. Yeah. So for the simple cases, it will do great. Whatever code it will give you, you can just take it and you know, you can run it, it will run. But yeah. as soon as you add some conditions to it, it starts giving you buggy, buggy code. And that is where it will actually drive down the productivity a little. Because uh, bugging, uh, debugging others' code is yeah. more less difficult than writing your own. That's pretty fascinating, man. I did have a, a question on the whole serverless thing as well, because if you were trying to implement it, and to your point, the cloud shell was a great example, which we kind of were talking about just before. How does it, like, you know, so when people talk about vulnerable serverless application, I'm going to talk about two services that are really popular in the AWS space, which one is the ECS container space and one is the serverless space. And I guess because one of the models is on serverless, what's the thinking behind that? Is that a vulnerable application running on, which is web facing vulnerable application running on Lambda? And that's how you get like once you said, I mean, what Tom, Tom mentioned earlier, then after from that, we basically exploit the web app first, and then we use the metadata to kind of, you know, exploit further. Is that the thinking and how easy or difficult is that? Because I imagine a lot of people don't even think about serverless from that perspective. All right. So model one of AWS code is actually based on the lambda, the serverless part. And the reason for doing that is because uh, even as a company, we actually use Lambda. Yeah. So a lot of code actually goes into this. So again, we were like, what is the best way to actually teach people that even when this is serverless, there is something which runs for some time. So generally, you know, whenever you read about serverless, people will say, okay, uh, you have some code and you have selected environment for it. This is pulled in runtime into a container and then the code runs and then it goes away. Doesn't work that way in real world. Just to make sure that they optimize things, this thing actually stays there for some time. Yeah. And you know, you can actually make sure that it stays there for some time where you can go into it, check the code, you know, if you have a button, a, a, you know, a, a foot into this by using a vulnerability or something. And from there you can do things, right? So, so that was the reason why we went with uh, serverless at that time, because we were using it. We were like, okay, I think this is a good thing to, to start with. Now, when, uh, what we are doing in that case is you have a web application which has full API endpoints as well as the front end part. So all of that is being served by multiple lambdas. And then in the back end for the storage, we are using ODB. And then there are S3 buckets where you have put some files and then there are other things like the roles and the IAMs and, and other things. So because most of the time, as I was mentioning, right, the entry point that you are going to get is going to be a web application or an API. So in this case, because this application has multiple vulnerabilities, you can actually use SSRM, get a foot into the container, and from there, you can dump the environment variables. You can see, okay, this, this string or this credential that is there, it can be used to access the DynamoDB. You go to DynamoDB, you find some information there, and from there, you go to other service, and so on and so on. So that is what the scenario is. And the same thing you can actually do in real world. It, because we are deploying on real Lambda, right? And it is not a problem on Lambda side. If your code is vulnerable, there is going to be some problem. Yep, yep. 
and is it the same for ECS as well? Yeah, yeah. ECS is also same. Yes. Again, the way you approach it differs because in case of ECS, uh, it totally depends uh, how it is uh, deployed. So when you deploy ECS, there are two ways of doing it. One is to have your own ECP machines running in the backend. And in other case, it actually takes care of it. AWS will automatically make sure that your image and everything is running in containerized form. You don't have to worry about it. So in the first case, we have not seen much because you know it is being managed by AWS. But in the other case, where uh, you have this EC2 instance running in the uh, in the backend and the containers are running there, and it is possible actually to run a privileged container there. But if you do that, you can actually attacker if he gets into that container he can actually break out and then he can access the metadata service of ec2 and from there he can take it on ec2 and then you know from there he can try to do other things which the ec2 can do because you can attach roles to it right? that is the module 2 right in which we have done all of this so in that the ec ecs is there which is actually running ec2 in the back wait when you say break out of container what do you so is that mean that the person is able to break out of the container to be on the EC2 instance itself? That's correct. If your container is misconfigured or it has more privileges, you can actually break out of that space and you can actually access that is uh, on EC2. Would that be because yeah. there's a volume attached? Because I would have thought that's, isn't that segregated to begin with? And I'm just going to pretend to be a fool here. It totally depends on how you have done things. So, you know, suppose in some cases, uh, again, uh, there are multiple tools which you use for monitoring your container uh, hosts. Yep. One of such tools is uh, you, you must have uh, heard about Sysdeck. Yep. They do container monitoring, right? Similarly, there is one more tool which is for there for uh, most of the proper host management. It's called uh, Putin. Mm. There are multiple such tools which, which actually uh, need your volume or, or the Docker socket to be monitored on those containers, even when they are running as containers, because otherwise they won't be able to function. Because they need to interact with the Docker host using the Docker socket, get all the data and then to monitor the actions that are doing, right? In this case, if you can somehow break into such a container, now you have the Docker socket monitored on it. So you can actually issue commands to the Docker. And if the Docker is running as which in most cases it is, yep. then you can actually break out of the container. So this is one scenario. Another scenario is when you are running something which actually needs more privileges. You have given it more capabilities or you have made it privileged container, which is a bad thing. You, know, you should not do it. And in Kubernetes, uh, you know, if you are uh, using a maintained thing, like, like the other option of for ECS, uh, you won't be able to do all this. But in the other case, if you have a need, then if you go to the EC2 based route, you can actually do all of that, and then the attacker can actually explore this. So again, it is a misconfiguration. You should not do it, but uh, it's not something that we have made up. There are real scenarios where you have to use things like this. But how, how do you protect against this as well, to your point then? Because a lot of people talk about, some people talk about the whole runtime security of uh, ECS containers as well, but how do you even, protect, I mean, I guess we kind of spoke about how do people can break out and uh, which could be a bad thing. How do people protect against this? Not have misconfiguration, so, I guess. Again, means the security in these things is also layered, right? So first thing is you don't need them to break in. So that is where you want to make sure the application itself is updated, the code and everything is good, right? Now, assuming that updated and people will be able to break in, then you have to put in things in places. So for example, this is there. Itself actually allows you to detect as soon as a shell is spawned into any of the containers. So as soon as if you do a dash or something in a container, Sysdig can actually tell you that. On your, it can send you an alert on your dashboard, and from there you will know that okay something is happening. And after that, if you configure it, it can actually see all the things that the attacker is doing. So there are multiple things, right? So you can detect it and then to contain it. If you have made sure that there is nothing valuable on the CPU. There is no overprivileged attached to the EC2. Then I think even if the EC2 falls into his hand, there is not much to worry about. So all these things are very specific to what you have actually deployed. If you have deployed something which does not need to access the database, then you don't have to worry about the database, right? Just contain the thing. And, but yeah. if, if you need access to a database, then you have to make sure that the data that is there is not something which you which the, which the attacker can do damage with, right? 
Buying that if you have some data on it, which is uh, important, right? Or if it has a role or something attached to it, if that is the case, then you have to worry about your, uh, your data as well as your database account. But if that is not there, the threat model again falls back to having control over the machine. What else you can do there? You can do the same thing here because it is again a machine, right? Yeah. If you don't have anything there which can be uh, you know misused apart from the machine itself. But I think that is where the threat is controlled. But if you have something else, then you have to worry about that as well. Awesome. I thank you for answering that as well. I think one more thing that I want to highlight: most people, right? So in Azure, when you run the VMs, most of the time people just think that okay, the VM is running. If even if the VM is on, the most chance that I have is to run the VM, mm. which is not true. If if it has internet connectivity. the user or the attacker can actually send a lot of data out and that will actually cost you way more money that you have ever anticipated and he can do it maliciously just to cause the bill or it can be a dos bot which is sending a lot of traffic so i have the speed in senses there uh, it was a very small machine i'll say 100 dollars uh, a month kind of machine and it got hacked by the the scanners that i was talking about right the automated scanners So once the machine was hacked, a DDoS agent was installed on it, and it participated in one of the DDoS attacks. And in three days, it actually sent over the, I think three hundred TBs of data. Oh my God! People don't actually think about this. That's the thing that is very specific to cloud. Because when you have your own machine, right, you're not being charged for uh, bandwidth. Yeah. But in case of Azure, I'm not sure about AWS right now, but uh, in Azure, you are actually charged up if you send this kind of data. It will run into tens of thousands, so that is also an aspect of damage. That's interesting. I think it does apply to AWS as well because the data out charge, but because generally the data out is not much, so people don't think about it. And to your Azure as well, people would not think about the data out. That's a good point, man. And I didn't even think about it. Actually, it could be used as an agent as well. The so lack of better word, the messaging. That's pretty awesome, man. I think, and we're kind of towards the tail end. I wanted to understand from you as well what's the future plan for AWS Gold as well, because I, I think that's just obviously that's one of the tools that people can use to learn and maybe extend that to make their internal training module or make their own if you if they want to. So that's pretty awesome that you kind of create that for the community. What's the future plan from your part for AWS Gold? So as I mentioned, right, it is going to be modular. So we are going to roll out more modules, but more than that, you know. So I did a survey on my LinkedIn and other places. And I ask people what exactly they prefer to see in AWS Gold. So most people actually voted to have defender-centric manuals. So what all things are there which can be exploited? How I can use native things from AWS to actually detect or contain those? Yeah. So we are currently working on that, and we are going to add those defender modules as well, so people can use them and try to see if they can do these things. So that is the next step. And as I was mentioning before, right? So just like AWS Gold, we have also created Azure and Security Boot. All of those are available on GitHub. You can download them. You can deploy them in a similar manner on your own accounts, and you can play around. And uh, again, means whenever you ask people to deploy things on their uh, own account, there is one thing that they worry about, and that is the cost. How much it is going to cost them? So we have actually given the estimates. On the GitHub page itself, it will not cost you more than a dollar to actually run it for one to two hours if you run it, and it actually comes under free quota. So if you have ran on the free quota, then only you will be charged. Otherwise, you won't be. So those are the plans. Uh, you know, adding the defender and then eventually the security engineering part. These are the things that you can fix in IAC to make sure that this thing doesn't happen. That's pretty awesome, man. And uh, yeah, I think be, having it as an open source project which anyone can use, and because so I think you, uh, when we were talking about this as well, you mentioned the licensing requirement for that project is pretty open source as well, so people can use it for their internal training purpose if they want to. Yeah, yeah, they can. 
So our AWS support and GCP code are under MIT. MIT is the most permissible open source license uh, you know, out there. You can do pretty much everything with this. And the reason for this is because, you know, we wanted to give back to the, the community from, from the, and, and our company has supported us a lot in this. Yeah. Uh, they have given dedicated time so that we can work on it and everything. So yeah, even if you know someone is facing a difficulty when they are creating their own modules for AWS code, we actually help out uh, those people. And we try to see if you know we can add whatever they are to their needs for that. Awesome. I think this, this would be a pretty good add-on for the follow-up conversation that we have later this week. So I mentioned this to you earlier, but I think we've got someone coming in who's going to talk what's it like to do penetration testing in the cloud world as well with scoping and everything. So another conversation later this week as well. So I think people, who, I'm sure you'll find out that conversation quite valuable, but that was kind of like the technical question that I had. I've got some fun questions for you as well. Three fun questions, which I would love to get to ha have you share your other side as well, which is the first one being what do you spend most time on when you're not working on cloud training or technology? Okay. I love gaming. So most of the times I'm playing Age of Empires, oh, nice. <laughs> the version four. So oh, yeah, nice. that's, the, that's the top thing. Second, I, I love cooking. So whenever I have some time, I do cooking. And then the third thing is to, to go around and see you know, what all is happening nearby. Yeah, that's all. Awesome. I think cooking is kind of what the, my third question, but the second, the second question, what is something that you're proud of, but is not on your social media? Okay. Okay. <laughs> that's a tough one actually. <laughs> So yeah, it is, it is work related actually. So the kind of uh, we have at uh, any make sure that their uh, customers can run labs 24 by seven in six different geographical regions, right? They are running thousands, tens of thousands actually labs every, every couple of days and keeping that infra up and making sure that it is secure and everything. I think that is the, the most thing that I take pride about, but I don't actually say it. This is the first time I'm mentioning it in the website. No, but I, as an engineer, I, I love that part, yeah. Yeah, as an engineering, I'm, I can imagine the, the scale of engineering that is also quite challenging as well. So I'm glad you're doing and uh, something to be definitely be proud of. Last question, and this is kind of related to your cooking, I guess. What's your favorite cuisine or restaurant that you can share? So, <laughs> again, it's, uh, I don't have a favorite favorite right now, but favorite cuisine, I prefer Indian. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Most of the butter chicken or something, yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, there you go, butter chicken as well. It's always good to have, I think someone in Sydney over here started something called the Indian kebab. And the Indian oh. kebab is basically a naan bread with butter chicken inside. I think as I found out, mm -hmm. I could make a kebab out of it. For people out there who, if you want to try an Indian kebab, that's what it is. Like basically butter chicken inside a naan, or like a rolled up naan. But that was most of the questions we had, man. Where can people find you on social media to kind of have follow up questions about the whole AWS Go and cloud penetration testing and all that as well? Yeah, means, uh, I'm on LinkedIn, I'm on Twitter, so yeah, all the questions are welcome. I get these questions, even for people that, you know, I have interacted like five years back, <laughs> so they're going to feel and they're like, uh, okay, this is the thing, uh, how do we tackle it? And, you know, I also learn from that. Because sometimes you don't think about things even when you're working uh, on it full time, right? Sometimes the outer perspective, the outsider's angle is uh, very valuable. So yeah, yeah, forward to all the questions. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for coming in. Everyone else who's joined us for the session, the pen testing session happening this Thursday, you'll see the live stream notification page. So definitely make sure you follow the Cloud Security Podcast page. But otherwise, I'll look forward to seeing you all. And thank you again, Nishant, for coming in. Well, I'll see everyone on the next episode and hopefully Nishant can come back in again. But thank you so much for this, Nishant. And thank you everyone for tuning in. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Bye. Bye.